knew he didn't kill himself, I knew somebody was shooting at us. And at that point, I didn't know where it was. I totally took out my sidearm and walked up to him and attempted to pull him inside, dragging his foot. As I did that, I was shot through the left side of my back over here, and it exited through my right leg. It came down at an angle. Where the individual was that was shooting at us was up at a, at a hill, and he had a rifle with a high-powered scope on it, and it was a 308 round. How many of you guys know what a 308 round is? Okay, it's a big, high-powered hunting round. So I went right down to my knees. It felt like somebody hit me in the back of the baseball bat. I didn't know what to do. Uh, I basically, sh we had glass doors in front of our barracks. There was glass with spider went from the bullet actually coming out to my head and hitting the glass. So I just pushed my way through. I had scars all over my forearm. I crawled into the barracks. And the first thing I know is when you're facing our door, you can see right into the other door that goes inside of our barracks. So we have a lobby and then we have another like steel door that goes into the actual barracks. All I'm thinking about is I want to get to that door. But I'm like, there's one way to do it. If that individual shooting at us, which I thought he was when I was hit, across the street from us in the woods, he's going to hit me directly going into that barracks. He's going to see me. So I have to crawl around, which the inside of our barracks is here. So I have to crawl around to the inside of that barracks, which I did. Two other troopers came out to that second door, pulled me inside, told them what was going on. As that happened, I was transported and life flighted to Geisinger Medical Hospital in Stratton. I was there for 30 days. There I underwent, for those 30 days, 11 major surgeries. After those surgeries, I went to eat allied rehab. I was an inpatient. From there, I started getting fevers and infections. They didn't know what to do. So I was transported to New York City to the hospital for special surgery. At that point, I had on what they call a philosophy bag. You guys familiar with that? It's basically, you go to the bathroom and put this bag that's you know, sealed up through your side. I had that going on. I needed a total hip replacement. My hip was shattered. My femur was totally shattered. What they did out there, they put a titanium femur in my leg. Um, they waited until the infections calmed down. Uh, then they could not affect me. My right side is. When the bullet went through, it severed that sciatic nerve, causing me to have a condition called drop foot or foot drop. If you guys are familiar with that, you cannot feel anything basically below your knee into your foot. You have no what they call dorsiflexion, no side. You can't run, you can't move your leg. You have no feeling in your leg. Your leg is very basically paralyzed. So I lost all of it. I had what they call muscle atrophy. I lost all muscle. My calf muscle was the size of my wrist at the time. I was devastated by this because I said I used to run marathons. I'm like, I'm never going to be able to run a marathon again because of this. Once I went through surgeries out there, to this day, I went through 20, even 20 major surgeries. The last one was not this December, but December of 2018. I decided to have my right leg amputated. The surgeons out there told me. If I amputated my right leg, there is a slight chance that I would be able to run again. Well, that was what was going through my head. If not, so be it. You know, I, I couldn't run anyways with the leg braces and everything else that I wore. So I decided to go through with it. I just started jogging not too long ago, which for me was the right choice. They were afraid that I was going to have a condition called phantom pain where you still feel that your foot's there and you're getting cramps and all this stuff. Well, I had more phantom pain when I still had my leg and I couldn't feel anything than I do now. I have no phantom pain. So that percentage went up for me. So my doctors were so impressed that, you know, I went through this amputation, but yet it improved the quality of my life. Going back to before the amputation, again, I wanted the year after I was shot, I wanted to do a marathon in any which way or form. That's how I met Earl Granville. Allied Services put me in touch with Earl Granville and said he does marathons and hand cycles. So he reached out to me, I reached out to him. He got me a hand cycle to do the New York City Marathon in 2015. Uh, we did it together. Ever since then, we've been paying my time. Um, he's like your brother to me. This past year, I got married to my wife in August, and Earl did the ceremony. 
I don't mean to go too far ahead, but a lot of you guys are probably wondering what happened with the case. Well, the individual that shot us took off in the woods that night. He did not see me where I was. He got scared and he ran. He was on a active manhunt by multiple agencies. Tons and tons of New Jersey state troopers, New York state troopers, Maryland state troopers, local Baltimore PD was up there, and U.S. Marshals, FBI, everyone was up there searching for this guy for 48 days. U.S. Marshals finally got him. It was just happened to be the location that they were in at the time. They located him, took him into custody, put the handcuffs on him that were the other troopers, Brian Nixon's, who was killed, and brought him up to our barracks. We just had the trial in 2017. They determined, the jury determined that he was guilty on all counts and he was going to get the death penalty. So right now he's sitting in, I think it's a uh, state prison out in Green, which is out in Pittsburgh, the farthest area away in the state from his family, which is up in Pike County, and actually Monroe County. And uh, that's where he's sitting on death row. Unfortunately, our governor right now, and I have mixed opinions about him, but he does not acknowledge the death penalty. So right now he's sitting on that Rowan bill is going to cover that knowledge. Anyways, besides that, guys, how many of you guys had a bad day? And you're like, come on, raise your hand. Everybody had a bad day. I had a bad day last week. Right? Yeah. 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 Right? September 12th of 2014 was my extremely bad day in my whole life. But you know what? I turned out that day and it was a positive day. And I'm not just here talking to you guys, which I enjoy doing, and sharing my story, and sharing the positivity that you can become from a negative situation. All right? I took that negative situation and turned it into a big positive. All right? I'm here today. I just started jogging. I'm going down to my prosthetic place to get tuned up for another prosthetic tomorrow, Philadelphia. And my life is good. You know, I got married to this great girl, girl did the wedding. I became best friends with a great guy. I mean, it's just, and it just takes off. It's not just, it's just in there. It keeps going, you know? It's what you make of the situation that's important. You can't just let something negative bring you down. When I was in the hospital, I was down. I thought I'd never be able to run again, and not just run, but I would never be able to get to a normal lifestyle. But you know, because of what happened to me, it changed my lifestyle. For a positive thing. I knew that I needed help and I didn't talk to anyone. My whole theory for myself was let me heal physically and then I'll heal mentally. And for me, that was wrong because what I was thinking was nobody, nobody who I could sit down with, not even anyone in my department experienced what I did. Guys were shocked, but they didn't go through what I went through and they can't relate. Nobody can relate to what I went through and I can't talk to that. Well, that was totally wrong. That is absolutely wrong. You know, guys, if you guys are having a bad day, no matter what it is, family, sports, school, just when you break up with your girlfriend, your boyfriend, who cares? Talk to somebody. Talk to one of your friends. Talk to one of your teachers. Talk to one of your professors. Talk to your family. Talk to somebody. It's it's better to then tell them about your feelings. I guarantee you, you'll feel better afterwards. Because I know I did, and I know a bunch of other people in the world. one of them. That felt better after they talked to somebody, no matter who that person is. I have this little female that I would care confident that I talked to. You think she, I thought she would be able to understand? She doesn't. She never went through what I did, but it's somebody to talk to, and she is phenomenal with me just letting up my healing. Tell her about my everyday activities. You know, I'm having a hard day at home. They, our girls are acting up. You know what I mean? She understands. Talk to somebody, and I can't stress that enough. You know, but what I'm saying is if you have a bad day or a bad outcome in life, something happens, got to figure in a car accident or something, <clears throat> make it and turn it into a positive thing. It's easy to do. It's all up here and it's who you are. And it's people like Earl who got me involved with Operation Born Warrior, and he'll speak more about that. It's a nonprofit organization. I part of this company called Thin Blue Line USA. Uh, if you heard of it, they all sell new line stuff, law enforcement. They're based out of Chicago. 
um, as part of that company, and it just skyrocketed from there. And it's not just because of my injury, but it's because I, like I said, I turned a negative situation into a positive. And like I said, God forbid, I know people that were in car accidents that I do rehab with that are in a bad situation, and they also have turned that into a positive. It doesn't like it. I said, you don't have to be shot, you don't have to get better, you don't have to get police officer. No matter what happens, if you're having a bad day, you can say, hey, you know what? I'm going to talk to this person. I'm going to make tomorrow a better day. Guys, thank you. I'm going to turn this over to Rose. Thank you. If you guys have any questions, I'm going to explain the box to you guys, and it's a great story after. Um, after Earl's done, feel free to ask me any questions, surgeries, incident, anything you want. All right, you're not going to hurt my feelings. All right, thank you. Okay, so now I got to ask you, you got to at least try to hurt his feelings. You said that, right? That's right. <laughs> hey, there's all about one thing before I start what Alex said. Um, guys, I got to stress this. There's no about what he just said. Sometimes we can't control what happens in our lives. We can't control the bad outcomes that happen. It's life. What we can't control is how we react to them. Did you hear that song, uh, Survive by Rise Against? Did you hear that? It was like last decade. There's something in the chorus. It's like, we've all been sorry, we've all been hurt, but how we survive makes us who we are. And I want you to think about that. Guys, my name is Earl Granville. I'm a nine-year veteran of the Pennsylvania Army National Guard. Uh, retired as a staff sergeant. I got a few awards in one of a few places overseas. A little about what I do now. I'm a senior at the University of Scranton, earning my degree in counseling and human services. I work for two nonprofits. One is called Operation Enduring Warrior. And it was called the Oscar Mike Foundation. We help wounded and disabled veterans and law enforcement continue to live an active lifestyle after dealing with their injuries. I'm a public speaker, and I travel all over the country telling my stories and ideas of healthy ways to battle adversity. And I play sled hockey for an all-wounded, disabled veteran team down in Washington, D.C. We're called the USA Warriors. And guys, i got to tell you, I am the worst freaking sled hockey player. You laugh, it's not even a joke. I want to back a little bit, ladies and gentlemen. When I was a senior in high school, my twin brother Joe was talking about joining the military. And I thought to myself, man, the, the age I was at that time and who I was as a kid, I thought there's no way I'm joining the military. I ain't working for the government. That was my mindset at the time, whatever. I'm not saying it's good or bad, it's just who I was. Well, <coughs> Joe and I, when we turned 16, we bought a car together. We got our license. We, we, we shared a vehicle for the rest of our years in school. Well, one evening, I had the car, and Joe asked if I could go give him a ride. He had to sign some paperwork with his recruiter. He's like, just drop me off real quick, you know, so I could sign some paperwork. I could just walk right home. I'm like, yeah, I can do that. Well, I ended up just going in with him. You can see where this is going, guys, right? So here I am. You could maybe call it being suckered in to join the military. But what made me join the Army Guard was the idea of having my education paid for. Okay, I thought to myself, well, I want to go to college, and I'm not getting scholarships when I'm through high school. So I thought to myself, you know, I'll give this a shot. So, Joe and I, we graduated high school. At this point, I already signed up. We had a good summer after high school, and we landed in Fort Benning, Georgia for basic training September 1st, 2001. You guys know what happened 11 days later, right? <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, those towers got hit when we're in basic training. You can imagine a little bit of anarchy going on. We don't have access to TVs. We don't have access to magazines. You know, smartphones weren't a thing at the time. And rumors start flying like crazy. There was a terrorist attack in New York City. Then there was a terrorist attack at the Pentagon. Well, the rumors just kept going. The White House got hit. All the monuments in D.C. were hit with explosions. And we don't even know what's actually going on. So here we are trying to train just for our military careers. And it was just two days of kind of like trying to get everything in order of what exactly we're trying to figure out what's going on. Some of these guys' families, they live in New York City. They live in Maryland and Virginia and D.C. 
Like, you imagine how it was. And with all that, people are now going AWOL. They're just jumping ship, getting out of the military. Man. Like, all of a sudden, everybody has flat feet, right? Like, oh, I don't want to join the military anymore because we're going to war. And you know what? My attitude at that time, I was one of those guys. I remember looking at my brother and saying, dude, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to jump ship, man. What do you say? And he looks at me and he says, look, don't be that douchebag, man. Let's get through this shit together. I'm like, all right, man, fine, we'll do this. Well, finally got through basic training, became infantryman, came home, and now you can get home for two weeks. We got a warning order from Bosnia. You guys familiar with the Bosnian conflict that we had in the 90s? It was a real threat towards us and had a huge civil war over there in Eastern Europe. And NATO got really involved because they were really slaughtering each other. So that's where we came into play. It was more of a peacekeeping mission. It's not like we're out there trying to attack the enemy. We're just trying to stop them from killing themselves. Well, the time we got there was towards the end of this conflict, which was in 2002. I think we were in the third last location over there. My first time ever leaving the country, seeing this beautiful country over there, kind of war torn and all beat up. The people were great. There was no real threat to us. But it was something I took home with me, man. It was a neat experience. I knew I didn't want to do this forever, though. Came home from Bosnia. I enrolled in a lot of my college in spring. I got two semesters in. And we got another warning order, and this was in Iraq. The thing with the Iraq deployment, though, if you were in Bosnia, you didn't have to go. It's a volunteer mission for those guys that just got back from Bosnia. In my mind, it was like, I don't need to go. Why am I going to go, right? Joe, on the other hand, he said, well, I'm going to go. I want to do this. About a little few days to sit down for a little bit and decide what I wanted to do. And you know what? I thought, if he's going to go, God forbid something happened. I'm going to go as well. I don't want to do this, but the time I get back from over there, my contract will be in, and then I'll be a civilian. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that was the best decision I have ever made. For that deployment, I was making everything about me. What did the military do for me? Oh, free education, a nice paycheck. Hey, this is awesome. I'll get a little bit out of this, and then I'll take off. Now, what could they do for me? Well, Iraq was a lot different situation than Bosnia. A lot more dangerous situations we were put in. <clears throat> and I understood the importance of being a part of a team. Something bigger than myself. I played sports in high school, but at the level of you know, situations we were at in Iraq, this isn't about me. It's about us. It's about my guys to my left and my right. It's about my platoon and that brother and sister who we created with each other. I never experienced anything like this. And I knew this was something I could do for the rest of my life. I saw the big picture. But here in Iraq, we had some bad days over there, let me tell you. We finally came home. The last thing I did in Iraq, I went to my commander, and I re-upped my contract for three years. And I knew I wanted to stay in the military. When we finally did come home, I got my associates at Lackawanna College, brought things up. And around that same time, we got another warning order. And this one was for Afghanistan. Same ballpark. If you were in Iraq, you didn't have to go to Afghanistan. I was like, well, I gotta go. Absolutely. I just graduated college. I didn't have anything lined up at the time. It's a good opportunity, right? Doing a job I love doing. <coughs> Joe, on the other hand, He'll stay back. He was married at this point, and him and his wife were having a child. So he said, look, man, this is my responsibility. I need to stay home, and I think you should too. And I said, no, I'm sorry, dude. I'm cutting this cord. I'm out of here. See you in nine months. On this deployment, this wasn't nitty-gritty in your face fighting. This deployment was more of like a humanitarian issue. We were in charge of help rebuilding parts of the country that the Taliban was destroyed. Renovating hospitals, building wells for villages so they didn't have to travel very far just to get drinking water. 
renovating schools, building schools. You know, the culture over there with the Taliban is they don't like females getting an education. We're trying to stop that from happening by building schools for them and pulling security sometimes during class sessions. It was a pretty neat mission. And with these going on, I got a lot of hands-on working with the locals, which I didn't have a lot of that in Iraq. But actually working with these other cultures overseas, I thought was really neat. And it made me learn a lot about these people. That they're no different than you and I. And I appreciated that a lot more. This is just where they were born. And this is who they are. And there's good and bad people in every culture in the world. And I met a lot of good people over there. Well, one mission, we were looking at a site to build a school in this little town called Dorma. And we were escorting civil affair officers at this site. And there was four main civil affairs officers that we worked with in our PRT. And this one particular civil affairs guy, his name was Major Scott Haggerty. And we would escort these guys from, you know, from our base to go look at a site. They would usually just sit in the back seat while our leaders would sit shotgun barking orders over the radio to the other vehicles. I saw in the roster that day, I was going to have Scott Haggerty in my vehicle. Well, the thing with Scott would like to do is he was just that guy who liked to be in charge of the vehicle he was in. He was much higher rank than I was, and I didn't argue it. But yeah, if you want to take my job that day. Some guys might get upset about it when he would do that, but I, I didn't really care. I thought, hey, man, gets me out of this job. How about this? I'll be your gunner, and I'll put my gunner as a passenger in another vehicle. That sounds good. On the fourth day of working at this side of the school, we're leaving the school site, and we had to map out a new route. The route we took to get there got really congested, and we got a little nervous as something was going on. So we met, we found this new route on our maps, something we never taken before. And our way back to Bob Zorma to get some rest before we go back to our base. First time ever. In Afghanistan, I've been there for three months at this point, guys. The first time ever in three months in Afghanistan, I saw bright green grass. And I know that sounds weird, but I remember saying on the headset, who the fuck is watering their grass in Afghanistan? Because <laughs> it's just something you don't see over there. It's a desert climate. I'm like, wow, this is neat. The very next thing I remember, I saw nothing but black. The best way to describe what I was hearing it's like, you know when you put your head underwater when you go swimming? And it's like just a faint noise that you hear when you're under when your head is underwater? That's the best way I can describe what I was hearing. And I felt the momentum. And in my mind I was saying, what the heck is going on right now? Eyes open up, big beautiful sky. About 2 30 in the afternoon over there. The Eagles destroyed. Holy shit, why am I bloody? Peter backwards. Started to process what's going on. He just hit an IED. Roadside bomb just tore my legs apart. And all I wanted to do was sit back up, try to stand up and assess the situation. How's everybody else doing? Is everybody else hurt? I just wanted to stand up and obviously it's not happening. So eventually, my medic comes running over to me. I'm seeing my buddy Reigns. He was the guy I put as a passenger in another vehicle. He runs past me and he says, hey man, you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. And then it gets to me. Doc Jones. Doc, how's everybody else doing? He's like, we're working on it. We're working on it. We're okay. We're going to get you guys out of here. Said, Doc, let's do this. He's patching me up. They put me on a litter. And they carried me behind one of the vehicles in case we got ambushed. And they were carrying me on this litter, four man team. They walked me right past two body bags. And I knew who that was. That was Major Haggerty, Scott Haggerty, the guy who took my seat that day. The specialist Derek Holland, Stillwater, Oklahoma. Derek was only 20 years old. And as they're working on me still behind this vehicle, I could smell this. Flesh burning. That's Doc putting quick clot on my right leg to stop the bleeding. 
It looks like I was gonna bleed out. And while he's doing that, I hear the chopper coming in. I finally lands. And three of my guys and an Afghan police officer carry me in my litter and put me on the medevac shop. And before it goes, my buddy Joe Boda, who I was screaming with that morning about some, some logistics where we just were just screaming at each other, calling out some nasty ass shit. You know, I just grabbed his, his vest and I pulled him in and I gave him a kiss on the cheek. I said, thanks for getting me out of here. Dude. Well, before that chopper took off, there's one more person that had to put on. We had an Afghan governor in the backseat of our vehicle. And he looked pretty beat up, but I, I didn't realize he was still alive. So they put him on the vehicle and all, on the chopper, and also they put on a that same police officer who carried me on my litter. Right? This governor looked ten times worse than I did, and my guess was probably in his fifties. I'm 24 at this time of my life, and this guy, he just looked a lot worse than I did. And I think age has something to do with your injury sometimes. Does that make sense? And he's vocally expressing how much pain he's in. And I don't care what your faith is, what, who you pray to, which could, you understand the culture we're dealing with over there with these people? None of that mattered to me at all. All I knew, the right thing to do at that moment, I just land on my right, I took my right hand and I just squeezed it with my left. And he squeezed back. And all I thought, I hope the two of us get out of this shit alive. Well, as the morphine started wearing off, all I wanted to do was kind of sit up and look at my legs. Okay? Like, they were almost backwards when I got hit. My feet were almost backwards when I got hit. And after trying to look up and struggling, I keep getting one of these. And here I am, trying to look at my legs. Get one of these while I'm laying down. After the third time I'm trying to look up, I get one of these again. I look back thinking it's the door gunner of this black hawk. It was that Afghan police officer. And we lock eyes and he looks right at me and he just shakes his head. And gives me a little compassion. Now the whole time we're over there, we're always told, don't trust these guys. Because it happens. We could be working with a unit. It never happened in my platoon. But we could be, you know, guys working with units, Afghan units for so long, and one morning, one guy would just go rogue. We always told him not to trust these guys. And here this guy is showing me compassion at a time when I really fucking needed it. That chopper took us to Bagram Air Hospital, Air, or, I'm sorry, Bagram Air Base, to the main U.S. hospital in Afghanistan. <coughs> the chopper landed. Ambulance came and picked us up and took us down the road to the hospital. Okay? We got inside, the doctors are talking to us. The doctor says I have to get surgery on my right hip immediately. He's like, You're ready for surgery? I'm like, Doc, you do what you gotta do. I mean, I don't know what happens now. This happened 45 minutes ago. I don't know where my life is going. Your life is in my hands right now. Before we went into surgery, that same Afghan police officer walked into my room. Big smile, and he looked right at me and did this. And he started talking. I didn't understand a word he was saying. And I'm pretty sure he didn't understand what I was saying either. But once again, this guy showed me compassion. And I'll never forget that, ladies and gentlemen. That's why I do this all the time. I went under for surgery. The very next thing I remember, I'm being woken up, and there's something in my throat, and somebody is pulling something out of my throat, and I'm kind of freaking out, swinging, like, you, ever, you guys ever have surgery, and you wake up, you don't remember anything that happened? That's exactly what I was going through at the time. So as I'm swinging at these nurses, trying to figure out what's going on, when I finally calmed down, one of the nurses explains to me, you're in Launchstuhl Air Force Base in Rothstein, Germany. And all that time in between traveling there, I have no idea. Later on that day, the doc says to me, hey, we're going to have to amputate your left leg. We think we can save your right. We're going to leave it salvaged for now. And my response, in total honesty, was, doc, you do what you got to do. I'm going to be pretty optimistic about this. So more and more surgeries at launch school. 
on my right leg, a clean cut, amputated through the knee on my left leg. Finally, I'm getting the green light back to the States. So I put myself and a bunch of other wounded veterans from the war in Iraq and Afghanistan on this huge cargo plane, C-17, and transfers back to Washington, D.C., Walter Reed Army Medical Center. This is going to be my home for a little while. You can imagine what this place is like. It's the heart of the Iraq War in 2008. Afghanistan picks up every summer when the snow melts over there. And I'm finally going to get to see my reunited with my family. My mom, my dad, my siblings. You can imagine how I'm feeling. I'm happy to see everybody. I'm feeling good. I'm not letting this bother me. I'm turning to me, and hey man, things could have been a lot worse. And one by one in ICU, my mom would come in and see me. She would leave, and my dad would come in and see me. He would leave. One of my siblings would come in and see me. They would leave. There's Joe. Joe's coming to my room. You can imagine the reunion. Big bro hug. I'm smiling, I'm laughing. I'm trying. I obviously look very altered from the last time he saw me. My skin is yellow from all the meds that thrown inside of me. But I'm feeling good. And throughout the day, Joe says to me at one point, I should have just gone with you, man. You mean gone with me, dude? You could have been killed. Like, let's be real about this. I'm here, man. Let's try to take the right road with this situation. You don't want to hear any of it. Like, come on, man. I'm here. I'm alive. My nuts didn't get blow off. <laughs> Being optimistic, ladies and gentlemen, right? <laughs> you feel a lot worse. <laughs> you didn't want to hear any of it. Guys, Gary, you guys ever hear of Walter Reed Army Medical Center? We got a guy here from Baltimore, so I don't watch the DC. Like you guys are familiar with Walter Reed at all? <clears throat> I, I, I know it was in the news like 15 years ago with some scandal or anything like that, so. A lot of these wounded and disabled veterans, or even if you're just injured in training or you need a surgery for whatever reason, a lot of guys go to Walter Reed. Well, at this time, in 2007, 2008, 2009, when these wars were so unpopular and there's so many wounded and injured veterans from these conflicts, you can imagine there's people everywhere with their lives altered, careers coming to an end, and you think of it as a somber place. I can tell you guys, Complete opposite. Yeah, it was somber to walk looking at a paper, but the attitude from all these patients, guys are in their 20s, like your age, okay? And it's not letting them down. And you're seeing guys pick themselves up and, and I'm not gonna let this define me. My time at Walter Reed, I learned how to snowboard again. I was introduced to sled hockey. You guys ever familiar with uh, ice hockey? Like sled ice hockey, you guys ever hear that? And you guys see the Paralympics? Like USA is the last three Paralympics in Winter uh, Winter Olympics. We got a gold medal. I mean, no team ever has won two in a row. We got three. I tried out for that team. Within 10 freaking seconds, I knew I wasn't good enough. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Walter Reed was making my giving me back my independence. And life was good. I was gonna figure this out and move forward. Made some awesome friends. Saw a lot of resilient people. Being a part of that culture helped me so much. And I wanted to take that with me as I was leaving Walter Reed. Medically retired, left Washington, D.C., and moved back home to Scranton, Pennsylvania. I haven't been here in a long time. The last time I was here, I had two friggin' legs. But we're gonna figure this out. I started dating a girl. She's a nurse at one of the Scranton hospitals. And her department every year where she works in the hospital, the doctors that she works for, they like to take the department out to like a black tie event to a fancy restaurant, like like a good job, guys, awesome year kind of deal, you know what I mean? Like it's just showing gratitude to the staff. We're getting ready for this event, right? I'm getting out of the shower, put my prosthetic on, I got my suit pants on and a t-shirt, you know, at the bathroom, doing my hair, some hair gel, when my phone rings. Right? I just let it go to voicemail, finish doing my hair. I, I get my 
suit shirt out and tie and all that stuff and I hang in the bathroom. And I finally look at the voicemail. It says my mom. So I listen to it. And she sounds very distraught on the other end. Early, you need to call me immediately. What's she wrong? So I call her back. And it rings. She picks it. When she picks up the phone, she says my name so ever sound. I say, Mom, what's the matter? Joe committed suicide. Worst day of my life. Here, Alex talked about bad days earlier. It's two I got right now. But that first one, I felt pretty damn good. And I really had a handle on it. And I knew I was going to get through this shit. That second one destroyed me. My life went to shit. How can I get the second chance at life when my own twin brother takes over there? I don't remember what was said on the rest of that phone call. I probably said I love you to my mom like 80 times. But the first thing I did when I hung up that phone is I went right to the damn kitchen. And every single ounce of alcohol I had, I poured it right down the drain. I grew up an alcoholic father. And I knew if I grabbed something right then and there, guys, part of my French, I was fucked. The very next thing I did after that, I went right to the computer and I got rid of all my social media. Just trying to process this and not want to hear from a million people calling you, reaching out. I just didn't want to deal with it. But it's inevitable. People are showing up at my door that I haven't seen in so long. My phone is going off the hook. I just didn't want to deal with any of it and just try to understand exactly what the hell just happened. And the next day, I had to go to Joe's house. I had to see his wife. I had to see his kids. And who else is there? His mom, his dad, some of my siblings are there, some of my cousins, some of Joe's friends, some of our friends growing up. Friends that Joe, Joe was working with. You can imagine the energy of this house and just what the mood was like. Seeing everybody like this, I just thought to myself, man, what do we do now? At this time when Joe passed away, he was active duty in our National Guard unit. Each unit had people who were active duty who worked logistics nine to five throughout the week. All right, so we're doing on active duty. So today is Saturday. Today is Sunday. Tomorrow's Monday. Let's, let's go to the armory, okay? There's my cousin Paul and my best friend Dave. Guys, come on with the armory. We're going to talk to Sergeant Peterson. We're going to figure this stuff out. What happens next, okay? We go up to the armory. We walk in. There's my old Randy Nascencio, Sergeant Peterson. He comes over, gives me a big hug, shows his gratitude, and it's Condolences, I'm sorry, I tried to do condolences. And there's another desk at the other end. It's Joe's desk. I take a box and I start putting stuff in it. And I say to Sergeant Peterson, hey man, did Joe get any benefits? Like, is the army going to pay for it? What about his kids? What happens there? Okay, sounds good. How about his uniform? Is that up to date? Because I want to, it's going to be an open casket, right? I want him to dress blue. I need you to get me these uniforms. I need this stuff for his uniform. I need you to come with me. We're going to go talk to Paul Bear and Carbondale. And I just started delegating all these tasks. I just kept myself so busy. And here I am prepping for my own brother's funeral, not even grasping exactly what I'm prepping for. Does that make sense? It's like that I didn't process it. I just kept myself going and not actually get a grasp of what the heck I'm doing. Well, the day came at Joe's funeral. It was four days before Christmas. Walked up to his casket, looking at my nines, my dress blues, giving that final salute. And that's that. Now what? You guys ever heard that term, idle hands is devil? I truly do believe that, guys. <coughs> 
Right when I like when I first joined the military, I made everything all about me once again. Feeling sorry for myself, playing the victim, thinking the world owes me everything. And let me ask you guys something. Being a victim, where does that get you in life? Claiming yourself as a victim, where does it get you? Nowhere. Absolutely right. But I had to make sure everybody knew about my military service and what I went through in my life. You guys ever seen the movie Napoleon Dynamite? You know who Uncle Rico is? I was that guy. Like wearing the football jacket except making sure everybody knew I served my country. Wearing a shirt that says dysfunctional better. You know what I did for you? You know what I did for this nation? In reality, I was just committed to it. A lot of Joe's friends, before Joe was active duty in the Army, he had a lot of buddies he worked with, or he was a corrections officer at a state prison before he got to, before he went active duty in the uh, Guard. I got to meet a lot of Joe's CO buddies. And one guy named Chris. Chris says to me, hey man, Joe talked about you all the time and so I'm gonna finally meet you. And I guess Joe was very proud of things I accomplished after the lost my life. And hearing that from a lot of these guys, like, oh, we talk about you all the time and all that shit. So, would you be proud of me now? And I'm acting like a shit. So, I decided to change a little bit. It didn't happen overnight, because right now I developed a lot of bad habits. So, I started off small and I started rough marching. You guys know what rough marching is? There's military guys here. But I'm not in the military, but like I know what, it's what you guys train so you can carry heavy things over very long distances. Usually it's company, it's a really big black bag accompanied by a sled. Yep. So basically, you know, what we call a giant backpack, you know, in the military, for simpler terms, we call it a rucksack. And a lot of times we travel by foot with a lot of equipment. We got like 60 pounds, 80 pounds in a rucksack, and we got to travel by foot. So I decided to do this as recreation. I didn't put 60 pounds in my bag, but I started off small. I put like 20 pounds in there, put my prosthetic on, and got some miles in. And every week, I would try to go a little farther. Kingston, you guys know where Kingston, Pennsylvania is? It's a dike mark every quarter of a mile. So I'd just walk on top of that dike and try to go farther and farther. <coughs> Eventually, I wanted to start running. I go back down to Walter Reed. I go to the prosthetic department. They link me up with the doctor. I said, Doc, can you sign me off the prosthetic, uh, a running blade? The doc says, let me, uh, let me look, let me see. you got to do a DEXA scan first, see your bone density, see if you have that ability. So we did a DEXA scan, the results came back, the doctor said, no, you're not allowed to run. You need more physical therapy, you need some more calcium in your diet, you got to build those, strengthen those bones before you can start running with that type of impact on your right foot. And I looked at my doctor and I said, Doc, I just signed up for the Army 10 miler. So what do I do now? And he says, well, I might not fucking run in it because I'm not giving you a blade. We're like, okay, so what do we do now? He's like, I can't make you not do it so you can walk it if you want. I'm like, sure, okay, that sounds good. But I didn't tell my doctor, I thought I'd ruck march it. 10 miles, right? That sounds like a good milestone. That's a check in the box, right? So I started the starting line of this event. If you have a respected disability, you're in that first corral to go off. Okay? So we show up at the starting line with a buddy, and I put that rucksack on, on your march, pistol goes off. And off we go. About 15 minutes later in the distance, I hear that pistol go off again. The next corral is coming. So as they're running past us, we're getting the whole damn time. Oh, good job, man. That's great. Oh, that's so inspiring. All that noise throughout the day, okay? Where, as the day went on, I didn't start, I didn't hear that anymore. You wanna know why? I was in last fucking place. <laughs> I didn't realize how slow I was going. And I swear, I'm so glad my friend was with me because I was just grabbing out of her shoulder, walking like this, thinking, what did I get myself into? So, any of you guys familiar with the Army 10 Miler? It's in Washington, D.C. It's obviously a 10 mile course. It starts and ends at the Pentagon, going through southern Washington, D.C. and northern Virginia. Part of this route, they close off I 395, 
one of the major highways in Virginia that ends at the PC Beltway. And they close off one lane highway where if there's tra vehicle traffic, they share the other side of the road so the runners and the hand bikers are on the other side, okay? So we're getting to this part of the course where we have to get on I-395. And as we're getting closer into the ramp, there's a police car there. And we, we get closer, and somebody comes out of that police cruiser and starts walking towards us. Well, if he walks towards us, like, what is this guy doing? He comes up and he has his hand out and he says, shakes our hands and says, hey, good job today, guys. You have two options. One, you get in the cruiser and I bring it to the finish line, you call it a day, you accomplish something today. Or two, I got to escort you down this road because you're way too fucking slow. We have the lanes back up. <laughs> well, I took the ladder that day, ladies and gentlemen. And I got to tell you, anybody who was in traffic that day, I am so sorry. <laughs> that race took me about four hours. At the time we got to that finish line, the finish line was torn down. No one, you, you get a coin when you finish. No one was there to give us our points. Like, but that didn't matter to me. Checking the box, I did it. I learned a lot from it, and this one was for Joe. And it just snowballed from there, ladies and gentlemen. Eventually, I started, I did start running again. Started off doing little 5 k uh, after Alex and I hand biked the New York City Marathon a few years later, I ended up running and I ended up running Boston as well. And it's just everything I can get my hands on. This is for Joe. This is for Joe. And eventually, this organization called Operation Daring Warrior, I ran into these guys at a Spartan race. Are you guys familiar with the name Noah Galloway? Anybody watch Dancing with the Stars in here? You know, a bunch of dudes who watch Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> All right, so there's this athlete who was on Dancing with the Stars. His name is Noah Galloway. What's significant about Noah is he was on Cover of Men's Health magazine, he was on Dancing with the Stars. He lost his left arm and his left leg from a roadside bomb in Iraq back in 2005. He's a guy I look up to. I ran into him at the Spartan race I was at. And I was kind of a little starstruck at the time. I was like, oh my God, like, I know who you are. Like, great to meet you. Well, he's part of this organization called Operation Enduring Warrior. Okay? And he's like, Do you want to run with us today? I'm like, sure, I'd be, I'd be honored to. Well, before the guys at OEW went to the starting line, you know, they say, Hey, come with us. And look behind one of the buildings. And they said a few words, and they're all in like military style uniforms. And then they put a gas mask on. I thought, Gee, I don't want to do that, do I? Well, they ended up running this event in these military fatigues and their gas masks. And the whole idea is OEW's mission is to honor, power, and motivate wounded and disabled veterans and law enforcement to live an active lifestyle after their injuries, not letting their injuries define who they are, and being a part of a team once again. You know, something I, I know I dearly miss when I had to get out of the Army. So this race is very challenging, but watching these guys do it and they're all get up, I thought, this ain't so bad, I could handle it. When we got done with this race, Noah asked me what I thought of joining this organization. And I sat on it for a little while, where eventually I'm like, this guy's asking me to join a guy I look up to, I can't turn this down. So I ended up joining this organization. This is it something you just hey, I'll join, welcome aboard. You have to earn a spot. Every masked athlete is current in formal military, and they sent us our next in depth class. We had to go through an indoctrin. And I went to my indoc class. We went down to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and they just put us through hell for a weekend. Like military style, all that stuff. There's 10 people in my class, five of us passed. And I was the only one with some type of you know disability missing a liver or whatever. Earning my mask on this team, I didn't realize that at the time. But looking back, I realized it's not about me. It's like that time when I first joined the military, it's not about me. It turned into that time when I went to Iraq. It's about us. Taking this responsibility. Leading once again, and guys, in situations like this. And moving forward. Guys, in life, there's three P's I want to talk about. Purpose, passion, heart of something. Everything I had in the military. Purpose and part of something. 
common sense is pretty self-explanatory, right? And the passion that comes with that was an instrument. So we wore a blue forts. And I realized that's just not in the military, it's in our lives. We all need that. We need those three feet for a healthy and happy life. But how do we get there? A good attitude? Because I tell you what, that Uncle Rico Shitty attitude that I had was again the anyway. Comfort zone, you have to leave it. You have to step out of it. And most importantly, it's something you guys can relate to. You guys are all athletes, right? It's a connection. You don't need connection. Two C's right there. What do I mean by that? Some Alex mentioned earlier. We're all going to go through struggles in our lives. Okay? We all face it at some point. Like Alex said, we all have bad days. Sometimes it's those people from your left and your right. They're the ones that can help you get out of this. And I guarantee you they want to see you get out of this. It's that vulnerability that you're going to show to those around you, to your teammates, your classmates, to carry that weight together of adversity. Does that make sense, ladies and gentlemen? You guys are more than just a team on that field or on that ball, you know, on that basketball court, or on that ball field, whatever it may be. Outside of that, outside of practice, you're always a team, ladies and gentlemen. And that's where that community comes into play. That's where those connections come into play. I want to show you something real quick. So guys, this is so this is Sydney the Cinder Block. Ooh, who is supposed to fucking laugh at that guy? <laughs> <laughs> I found half a Cinder Block one day on one of my runs with my friends. We're running Warrior Dash in Long Pond, Pennsylvania, two years ago. There's a half a Cinder Block sitting on the ground. Correct. Right? For whatever reason, my friends had chains. We put the chains around it. And we just carried it together, taking turns, and we brought the finish line. I put it in the back of my truck and called it a day, right? No reason for it. My friends in the Oscar Mike Foundation, they follow me on social media. And they said, Why don't you bring that center block? How many races you do on So I'm like, All right, fine. So, bringing this out more and more, you can imagine. People are asking, What do you do to that? And I really didn't have an answer. So I decided to give, it, give an answer of it. What Cindy represents is a heavy mental adversity. We're all going to face in society, guys. Guilt, stress, depression, anxiety, loss of a loved one. Maybe shit's going sour at school. Maybe your parents are fighting. You guys get the idea, right? All that shit that holds us down and stops us from enjoying life. Us as humans, though, we can figure that out. We'll move forward with that. No big deal. Also, us as humans, though, sometimes we might get lost. We don't know what to do. When things get really unexpected, things get really heavy, and it really starts to control our minds, and we don't know where to go forward. I used all my resources. What is next? Sometimes we need a little break to carry that weight. When we run with this in Oscar Mike, we all take turns on that course carrying it together. So nobody carries that weight by themselves. And that's the same with all of you. You really like it. <laughs> <laughs> Up in here, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to have your struggles. You're going to face it first. You're not going to know what to do or move forward. Sometimes it's those people around you. It's that community and those connections and those cultures you're part of that'll help you get through. Does that make sense, ladies and gentlemen? Sure. Find those three C's: purpose, passion, part of something. How do we find it? Attitude. You have to have a good one. Step out of that comfort zone. Community, connection. Don't forget that, ladies and gentlemen. Never carry this by yourself. Questions. 
Hey, what else we got? 